Um, okay. Um, man, just uh, uh, a couple of things, and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get into this. So, um, as I said, it's been a whirlwind this week. On Thursday, uh, we had the closing. Everything went well. Uh, so we are now guests in someone else's space, their place. And uh, New Covenant Church has been amazing. The way that they have uh, treated us and how they've walked through the, the transition. And, but starting tomorrow morning, a couple of things start happening here. One is they start there, they have uh, uh, 21 days of prayer. And so they're inviting some of the new people to come out here and pray. Secondly, I don't know how this is going to work. They're going to start ripping up stuff, carpets and flooring, and and there's going to be so much going on here. Initially, we thought that we had a couple of weeks before that kind of stuff started happening, but... um, uh, we, uh, we're finding out that the need, every, everything's shifting and changing. So we're having to make decisions on the fly as well. Fortunately, we were planning way ahead. And so even though you plan, what's the classic proverb? Yeah, yeah. man plans his way, but the Lord directs his step. Well, God, I thought this was the plan. Yeah, it is kind of the plan. Partly yours, maybe you got a little of mine, but here's the, here's the steps, here's the direction now. So, so we're, we're pivoting as, as, it, as the need arises, okay? So, um, so what does that mean? That means that we have one more Sunday here. Next Sunday is our last Sunday that we will be here to worship uh, together in this way. And now... That's bittersweet for some of us, some more than others, uh, but uh, I'm looking forward. I'm looking to, to the future. So what's, what's the most nearest future point right after next Sunday? Um, two weeks from today, we will be meeting at Walker's Mill, and uh, that is We're going to give you a packet that will give you how to get there and everything. Real excited about that. But but we are just going to gather for a big, that Sunday morning is going to be a big giant breakfast or brunch, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I thought I would get some cheers, some claps or whatever. But we're, we're going to gather out there. We're going to put a team together. We're just, our first experience out there is just going to be a time of fellowship. We're going to, we're going to eat. We're going to have bacon and eggs, biscuits, waffles, pancakes, whatever, bacon, sausage, whatever you like. We're just going to, that's going to be our grand experience going out there. And then the following Sunday, we'll start getting into the rhythm of what that's going to look like. But we, we, I just wanted to put that out there now so you know what is coming. There will be uh, no Wednesday nights in the month of January for our church, for the adults, okay? Uh, the youth will be meeting, okay? They're going to start. Why are we not doing that? There's just so much to do. We want to get settled we want to make this transition, get settled, and start fresh and new. Our prayer advance uh, that was scheduled, that was going to start next week and go for the, for the following week, and, and I really felt like the Lord has given some direction for that, but we're going to move that into February because to try to do it here and the use of the facilities, our own prayer room, is just going to be too, too challenging, too difficult. So... I do think that's one of those directive steps of the Lord, and I think it's going to be so much more powerful uh, as, as, we, as we move on in, in that direction. So those are just a few quick things. Now, this morning I'm going to share, I'm just going to call this uh, a new future, or a new journey, I'm sorry. It's a new journey. This is a new journey part one, and next week will be a new journey part two. Today it's going to be general, big picture. Next week, it's going to be some detail. And um, so I want to pray, and then we'll get into this, okay? Mm-hmm. 
Father, what a blessing it has been for all of us who are here, however we got to this point, to know you, to serve you, to walk in your grace, your truth, your love. Lord, you've been with us through many, many things, Lord. And we thank you that you're not just the God of the past and the present, but you're the God of the future. And so, Lord, you have a new journey for us. Lord, I pray that you keep us together, that you lead us, that you guide us into something that is glorious something that's full of life. Speak to our hearts today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, So, right before we were closing out worship, um, uh, three men came over to pray for me. Uh, Greg Sykes and Ed and Jeff McCauley, uh, they get around and so say, I want to pray for you. And, and so, I'm, I, man, I'm always welcoming prayer. And Ed started to pray, and he prayed that God would make me a ball of clay. In other words, clay can be shaped, right? And we, we've seen the picture of, of that, you know, Bible uses that terminology sometimes, that description, that we're moldable, that we're shapeable, that we can become something different. And I, I know his prayer was, Lord, let, let, let Bo be like clay that, just, that you can mold into whatever shape. And, and I know he was praying for this moment, how, whatever I share, and I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, God, I, I, I want to enter into this next season of life. I want to be I want to be clay. I want to be soft and pliable and moldable uh, on this journey. I don't, you know, sometimes I don't feel like clay. I feel like a dirt clod. And what is a dirt clod? What 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 happens when you try to shape a dirt clod? It just starts crumbling, right? And just breaking apart. You and you just all all the ground. You can't do anything with it. You know, it's like when do we get to the place that we're not moldable anymore? pliable, soft, shapeable, you know. So, so thank you, Ed, and guys, for praying for me for that. I will say, anytime you pray, pray for me, continue to pray that I'm like clay, okay? But uh, at the same time, would you make that your prayer as we move on this journey together, that, that anytime you move from the old to the new, you have to be pliable, Change really is a constant. You know, we, we like sameness as a constant, right? Because it didn't, it's always the same. But, but if something's always changing for the good, that needs to be a constant in our lives as well. Okay? All right, if you'll turn with me to Malachi chapter 2. We'll... So I have felt like I knew what I was going to share for several weeks when we got to this day. And uh, then Art Boucher walked into one of my many offices. For some of you who who know (laughs) around here, I have rooms that I go in and I I practice squatter's rights. I start laying out tables and stuff and I work there and then I abandon it and I go start another one. And and so I know it's a joke around here, but uh, I'll... Man, bring it on me. I don't care. It's, uh, it's, it works for me. But I was sitting in one of them. I was doing my thing. And, and Art comes in and he says, hey, I want to read something to you. And it was Malachi chapter 2. And he, and yeah, <clears throat> sorry to act like you. So Art comes in and he sits down and he gets his, his Bible and he goes, you've seen me do that, right? 
you know that something's getting ready to come out of his heart when he does that. It's, you know, and so I said, okay, I'm ready. What do you, yeah. And so he starts reading this. He goes, that's what I want to see. And I'm like, yep, yep, it's good. And I'm going, I've already got what I'm supposed to share again. And, and so, but I listened and I said, I need to go back and read this. And, I, and I'm familiar with the story, but uh, over the week, it's been all week, I've just been meditating, praying, and, and, and I just begin to go, oh my gosh, this speaks to where we are, who we are, what God's trying to do. So I hope you'll, you, and I decided not to give you PowerPoints. I don't want you to get lost in all that. And I don't even have this board up here except for one little thing that I want you to be able to see. So this is just kind of shooting from the heart. And uh, so let's look at this. Haggai chapter two. Now, I do have to just give you a little bit of backdrop, okay? Malachi. Haggai. Did I say Malachi? Well, I'm moldable, shapeable, so, so, so it's Haggai. Haggai chapter two. Okay. Um, sorry. Don't read it, just turn to it, because let me, let me just give you just a little backdrop, okay? Um, so, as you know, Israel and Judah, the, the two kingdoms, the, the northern and the southern kingdom, at some point were taken into captivity, right? They were taken for roughly 70 years of, of captivity, uh, by an, another empire, Babylon and Persia in there, and all of this is going on. And, and then they are led back. God has a promise. It's not going to be forever. You're going to be taken out of this physical exile, and you're going to be brought to the promise, back to your promised land. And Judah was the southern kingdom, and, and this is where Haggai the prophet is speaking to. Now, when, they, when, when the... When the uh, the king of Persia allowed these Jews to go back to their homeland. They were going back to build the temple. The temple had been destroyed 70 years earlier. And the temple was the place of God's presence. It was the place of God's glory. It was where, God, where, where, where the, God, the people of God came to meet with God in, in the most closest personal way, okay, and all that goes on there. And so the temple's been destroyed, they're, they're in exile, but now they're brought back, and they're instructed to rebuild the temple. They get started on the temple, but they start encountering all kinds of things that, 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 make, you, that make you quit, um, I want to make sure I ha I'm not losing you. Look, look, look back here at me, okay? All right, thank you. All right, so, so they, they get distracted from different things that happen in life, just like you and I can, and they stop building the temple. And this goes on for about 16 years, and they're just not making that much progress. They, 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 they get lethargic, they get, I don't know that God really wants us to build this. I don't know that God's really with us anymore. We just, so they start building their own homes. They focus on their own lives and not on the temple. And so that's where the story picks up in chapter uh, two of Haggai. And I'm just gonna read it and we'll see some things that will jump out at us. So here it is. On the 21st day of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Speak now to, to Zerubbabel, the son of Shiltiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Now let me just tell you, those are big, long words, and I don't want you to stumble over them. All that is, is you have, you have two, two leaders, 
okay? You have the leader over Judah, and you have the high priest, and then you have this remnant. What is the remnant? It's the remaining people, okay? The remnant, there was a whole bunch of people, now there's just a remnant that remains. And, he's, and so, he's spe- so the prophet Haggai is now gonna speak, and this is what he does. He comes and he asks them a question in verse three. Who is left among you who saw the temple in its former glory? Now, we won't even look at the second question yet. This, is, this prophet's walked in, he's assembled the people, you're the remnant, and this is what he says, who among you remembers you saw the former glory of the temple when it was in its most pristine condition, when things were happening, when the Shekinah glory was shown, either, either a, a, a pillar of fire or a, a column of smoke, you know, day and night, all of those things, when the glory was there, I didn't even know I had water. That's great. It busted. Sorry. And, and so when all of that was when all of that was happening, you know, it was exciting times. They loved it. They came. God is among us. This is awesome. God's blessings are here. God is protects us from our enemies. All these things happen. We're here to worship God. It's a glorious experience. And he asked them, he asked this remnant of people who, have, who, who are back to their homeland, supposed to be building the temple, but they haven't been building it. But he says, any of you, were any of you living at the time? Do you remember the temple? Because this is 70 years. These people might have been 80, 90 years old, and there would have been some of the remnant that would have been able to say, I remember when, yes, I saw the glory, <laughs> you know? So you're gonna have a few, but most of these of the remnant would not have because they were born in exile, and they grew up in, in Babylonian ways, okay? And now they're back here, and there's this old temple-looking thing that's half-built, we're trying to rebuild it. And, and so he says, ask him the first question, any of y'all remember the former glory? But then he asked him another question. How do, how do you see it now? When you're looking at that foundation out there that's crumbled, that's half constructed, do you see that? And he says, does it not seem to you like nothing in comparison. Those of you who remember the former glory and now you see the temple, does it not look like nothing in comparison? It it, it just looks like there's no life. There's no glory. There's no purpose. There's nothing there, okay, to get excited about. Verse four, look what the prophet says. But now, take courage, Zerubbabel. Take courage also, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and all you people of the land, in other words, the remnant, take courage. Three times, Haggai says, Take courage. He says to the leadership, take courage. He says to the, to the remnant, take courage. Why? He goes on to say, take courage, declares the Lord, and what does your version say? Work. Ah! Key word there. Take courage and work. What does he mean by that? Work. And and look at this. For I am with you, says the Lord. We gave up working because we thought that our God was not with us anymore. The glory has moved on. The Spirit is not there with us. 
And this is what happened. This is what happened to the people of Judah, to the, to the remnant. They had started a decade more trying to rebuild. Yeah, we were, we were set free from, from, from captivity. We're back to our homeland. We start doing, yes, we were told to, to work and to build this, but it just seemed like we got hit with one thing. Enemies hit the land famine, all kinds of stuff just knocking us down, knocking us down, knocking us down. So we lose heart, we lose spirit, we think God's not with us. So what do we do? We go and we focus around ourselves, our own house. If you read chapter one, that's what they did. They were building, they were focused on their own personal individual futures, building their, their houses, doing all their kind of stuff, okay? Now, he says to them, I want you to take courage. Be- I want you to work again because I am with you. Verse five. As for the promise which I made you when you came out of Egypt, this is even going further back, my spirit is abiding in your midst. As I promised, when, when you were under, you were born in captivity under Egypt, right? Moses takes him out and he says, I promise my spirit's going to be with you where you go. And then there's a tabernacle and then there's a temple. Temple gets constructed. That's where God's going to meet with his people. But hey, it gets destroyed, you know. But he is saying, For the promise which I made you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit is abiding in your midst. Do not fear. Take courage. Do not fear. I am with you. Therefore, I want you to work. Verse six. For thus says the Lord of hosts, Once more in a little while, I am going to shake the heavens and the earth and the sea also and the dry land, and I will shake all the nations, and they will come with the wealth of all the nations, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. In other words, the temple is is made with stuff and it's also filled with all this stuff and there's glory just in the temple itself even without the people or without the presence of God but what really makes it glorious is the presence of God and then this last verse the latter glory of this house this temple in other words that's about to be constructed because you're going back to work to build this, the latter glory of this house will be greater than the former. Do you remember, any of you of the remnant, do you remember the, the former glory? Do you remember what it looked like? Do you remember what happened there, the activity that happened there? Do you remember when I met with God's people there? Any of you remember that? Well, let me tell you something. The latter glory of the house you're going to build now is going to be greater than the former. And then he says this, and in this place I shall give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. Now, Was that just for Judah? Was that just for Israel? Was that just for the Jews? Was that just for God's people in the Old Testament? Or does this, can this speak to us today? Oh, this is almost like a template. I could take what we've been through over the last number of years and just fit it all the way through that. There are, there are some, a few, I, I look at this church body right now in some ways as a remnant. 
because, and I, I'm, I'm, I will not, I'm, I'm not going to, I, you know, we're only supposed to speak positive words these days, okay? That's the climate we're living in. Bible's not like that. It'll tell it like it is, okay? Okay, so we've gone through some darker times, haven't we? We've had our own spiritual exile. It's not a physical exile, but about five, four or five years ago, I think we went into a spiritual exile as a church. Some of you were here six years ago, eight years ago, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, and you can remember, I I would like to ask you this question that Haggai asked, okay? So Bo is not a prophet, but Bo is going to ask you the same question that Haggai asked, okay? Who is left among you who saw this church in its former glory? You don't have to, okay, (laughs) there went a hand, there went a few hands up. Okay, there's some hands. Um, So we experienced at one time. It, this, was, this was a glorious place. I don't want you to feel bad. I was like, you mean there's, we're, we're just ragamuffins? No, you're not ragamuffins. You're awesome. You're awesome people. You're a remnant, a holy remnant. God wants to do something fantastic with. But, but I'm, I'm just saying, you can, you, some of you can remember a time, and, I, and, and we can say, we could have asked this, this past winter and spring, like last year in 2022, we could back it up two years ago during the pandemic. We could back it up to, for those who remember when your ill-conceived idea of Pastor Bo having a church-wide conversation that opened stuff up that went crazy. Or you can remember when we tried to finish a building, thought we had it and we didn't have enough to finish. All those things we're like one hit after another after another. Just, just, like, just like Judah can remember a time when awesome things were happening here. How many remember a time when we were 350 bumping 400 people in here? Yeah. How many of you can remember when we had, we, we have an awesome worship team now. I'm so thankful and grateful for them. I don't, I don't care about having multiple teams or not or any of that kind of stuff. But how many of you remember when we have three worship teams that rotated through? Yeah. How many of you can remember when we would have prayer times up here, there could be 50 people up here just being prayed for almost every Sunday. We'd be in worship and people would be taking people to the cross and just, we all, you remember those things. How about all the, the baptisms how about some of the, the youth ministry things that were going on at the time? Anybody remember a, a more glorious season? No hands went up. No, I see some, head, some heads going, okay. Yeah, okay. There was a time when God did glorious things. Now, I'm not saying he hasn't been doing glorious things right now. He is. But there's something unfinished here. okay. We've not arrived. Um, so, what does God's word say to the leadership of the church? What does God's word say to the remnant? Do we, do, do, do we need some, some help back here? We're going to take a pause. I think, I think we're okay. We'll let them tend to. So, let me 
have your attention again if I could. What would God say to us right now? He would say, take courage. Take courage. Take courage. And then what? Work. God works through his people when his people work. But what happens is when you feel like the glory is gone, when you feel like his presence is not there, when you feel like, you know, we're tattered and torn or whatever, what do you do? What's the first thing you start doing? Stop working. Isn't it? We stop working. We, we don't know, has the, has the glory departed? Has the, you know... And that's what they were feeling. But they did not give up because God had something, God had something greater. So he goes on to say, I'll just, I'll just jump to it. And, I, and this is what I believe, that the latter glory will be greater than the former. Now you're all way too sober for me in this moment. I, I, this is where my heart is. I have, I have these expectations moving from this place to where God's going to take us. That, that whatever God wants to do, and, and by the way, this is not about, this is about the Lord. This is not about us, per se. This is not about any of us getting glory. Because I want to show you something. I want you to see that this is Okay, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't know that I can draw a good description of a temple, but let's let this be it, and we'll put a foundation down here too, okay? Let's let that represent the Old Testament temple, okay? This is the temple that Solomon built, and now the people of Judah are trying to rebuild, okay? Where, and so here's the people. Let's make one of them a lady. So they're not, here, we'll make several ladies. Okay? So here's, here's the people. Here's the remnant. Now, the temple itself, the temple itself is where the glory, well, we'll just put it here. This is where the glory dwelled with the temple in two ways. One way was how it was constructed and decorated with gold and silver and, and all the things that were in it, all the things they were told to place in it. All those things made the temple as a physical construct glorious, okay? But here's what really made it glorious was the presence of the Lord, right? Okay, now... The people, to experience the presence of the Lord and the glory, had to go to the temple. Y'all can see that up there. Had to go to the temple to, to experience. So, so the Shekinah glory, all of that would take place there. 
and they knew that God was in their midst. And, and I want you to hear this phrase. Uh, verse five. My spirit is abiding in your midst. Do not fear. So the spirit, which is the presence of the Lord, the spirit abided in their uh, midst, okay, was among them. And for them to experience that, they had to, they had to go to the temple. Now, I want you to see what the New Testament teaches. So here we go. We'll make people again. I'm always making stick people. I don't know why. Okay. And let's, let's build an old, because you'll recognize this. Let's build an old style. What is that? <laughs> That's a church building. Okay. Now, now, here's the thing for you to know. God's people often go to church buildings. But let me tell you, in the New Testament... This is not the temple. This is the temple. And this is not where the glory dwells. This is where the glory is. And I also want you to know that the Spirit, the Spirit, doesn't just abide amongst us. The Spirit dwells within us. So, let me just show you this. If you turn with me to Ephesians chapter, mid, middle of Ephesians right quick. Okay. Uh, so Ephesians 3, verse 20 and 21 is, to me, is the high point of the book of Ephesians. You know, you know what I love about Ephesians? When you read all, every one of Paul's letters to all the different churches, he usually has a lot of things to correct. Y'all aren't doing this right, you're not doing that right, you're not doing this right, you're not living morally right, on and on and so forth. And he's correcting things. You get to Ephesians, and it's like this beautiful depiction of what the church of God, of the living God, needs to look like. And what it accomplishes and what it does. Okay? And so, so you come right here, he's building up to this high point, and this is what he says. Chapter 3, verse 20. Now, to him meaning God, to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. What has he just said? The glory is in the church and in Jesus. And the church, one of the descriptions of the church is it is the body of Christ, right? So he's saying, I want the glory to be in the body of people, not in a building. Now, here it was in a building, but in here, it's not. It's in the people. And we jump right over to uh, chapter 2 while we're in Ephesians. And he says this. He says, uh, so then, you're, this is who you are. You are a whole building, verse 21, being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord. Now, let me ask you a question. How does a temple grow? How does a physical building grow? 
When you come in here, have you noticed any growth in our facilities? This is inorganic stuff, isn't it? You don't walk out here and notice one day. It looks like the foundation is multiplying and growing out there. No, if, if anything, we build onto, right? But it doesn't grow. So how does a temple grow? He just says, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Guys, this is speaking about us. This is speaking about us. Am I not smiling enough at y'all? <laughs> I just, I'm trying to smile as I'm, uh, I want to see smiles. This is who you are, people. This is who we are. We are the temple of the living God. We are the ones that God fills with his glory. We're the place where, where people ought to find God. I'm, I mean, that's who and what he's making us to be. If we're, we're, we're an organic building, not this. And we, we the, God's spirit dwells within us. We ought to be the most life-giving people on the planet. It ought to flow out. But you know what has to happen? You and I have to take courage. The voice of God is take courage and begin to work again. Fear not, I am with you. And if we begin to believe that, then, then you and I, God will start working again. And so we cannot assume that a move of location changes anything. A new building doesn't change anything. What changes is the remnant, is the people that says, I believe, I trust you, God. You're growing us into a temple that you inhabit, that you dwell in. And that's when it's amazing because now the glory is not like drive by, look at that glorious edifice over there. No, no, no. It's like, look at that glorious body of people, what God's doing through them. That's, that's, the, that's where it gets exciting. But we have to shake off <laughs> that old past. How many of you would raise your hand and say, Pastor Bo, I've been a dirt clod for a while. No, you don't have to really raise your hands. Jasmine, you weren't going to raise your hand, were you? Okay. No, but you're going to raise your hand and say, but I'm ready to be pliable. I'm ready to, to, to work what that requires. Well, we're going to talk about that next week because we are out, way out of time. Okay. But because next week I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get down into the details of what that looks like. That's where I'm ex excited to be for us is what does that look like, you know, moving, moving forward. So I have like five things to share with you on that next week. And um, so... Maybe, maybe I should end it on this. Turn to Matthew chapter 9. How we doing? Are we?
I've wanted to quit. Multiple times in these last three or four years. And I believe if you were to share, some of you would have said the same thing. And some of you persevered through it. Others just kept believing, I think God's got something for us. But, um, you know, you go through things and you just, it, it's, it's, you know, again, like Haggai, uh, the people said, man, there's no life in this anymore. So that you turn to your own things. And he's trying to awaken them and rekindle vision for what he wants. I want, I, I want to build, I want the former, I mean, the latter to be greater than the former. And it will be. If you, if you believe and follow and are willing to work and, and trust on this, but sometimes I feel like it's too much water under the bridge. It's just like, do I want to go through this again? You know, all, all those sorts of things. You just get plagued with all that. Uh, have I aged out? You know, all of these sorts of things that you just, you, you, you ponder. But the Lord has just, he won't release me, <laughs> for starters, okay? And then he has encouraged me and challenged me and inspired me and everything else from this verse right here. Matthew chapter 9. Verse 37, and I'm not going to give you the context. I'm not going to give you all the other. You're, you're well familiar with it. Then Jesus said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the labors or the workers are few. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. What is that? There's a harvest out there that's plentiful, but there's not enough workers to harvest it. Bo, if you quit, you say, well, somebody else take your place. It's not enough, though. If we give up, the remnant, and say, well, this church down here and this church over here and that one over there, they can get the job done. It doesn't work like that. And it's not one big church. One big church can just keep getting bigger, 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 bigger. We'll find the best ones and we'll consolidate all of our churches and efforts into one big. That's not God's strategy. His strategy is it spreads everywhere. It's like dandelions. You know, you got one right there and you go, golly, if I go kick that or let the wind blow it, I'm gonna have 50 dandelions before long. You know, God didn't try to go bring all the dandelions right here. No, it's like spreading everywhere. And that's, that's the way it's supposed to be. There should be churches on every corner. Not necessarily buildings, not glorious edifices that way, but people, people of the living God. So, so what I'm saying is, what benefit is there if you say there's another church that can do it better? Praise God for that. Paul, I think, did a better job than Peter, but God needed both Peter and Paul, right? They both planted Timothy. Paul was probably better than Timothy, but he was training Timothy to do these. There's never a, you don't read in the Bible, shut the church down. That church is dead, shut it down. It's like, no, restore life to it. They're part of the people of God. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And so I look at this and I go, God, you're not gonna release us? You mean the harvest is still plentiful? The word, there's not enough workers? What if we right now start right now and we, and, and we take that work on? I will be a harvester. There's still not enough of us. We need more. So we need to multiply 
so that we can have more out there. And the church is down this way and over that way. They need to be doing the same thing until we cover the globe. That's the point. And because of that, there's like three or four other things I'd love to just go do with my life and I feel like I would be following the people of Judah who got focused on their own little worlds. Yeah, I could do that. That, that would be, you know, and I would be missing the glory of his kingdom. Because I think God's got something better. Everything moves forward to the future, not the past. <sighs> Art. <laughs> I got to end up, oh, oh, huh? You're all in, yeah. No, I was just trying to figure out how to close this because I just now feel like I'm ready to share what I want to share with y'all for next week. So... I, I, We're with you. I, no, I, I'm, I, and, and thank you. I'm not trying to pull that out of you. I'm just trying to end this. <laughs> so, amen does it. Amen does it. All right. This is where we say, let's get busy. Let me, let, let me just say this. I believe that God is leading us into a fun, exciting, spiritually growing, life-giving time when we go out to um, Walker's Mill. That three months, I, I, it's gonna feel different, it's gonna look different, but I think it's gonna go deep for us. And here's one of the things that's gonna happen. You're gonna get to know everybody. Every, we're gonna know, we're gonna be friends like we haven't been before. We're gonna know what's going on in each other's lives better. We're gonna be able to care for one another. It, you know, it's just, and, it, and it's just gonna, it's gonna be, it's gonna be good. I think it's gonna be three things, and I, I'll just have to end on this. I think that three months is gonna be a time of rest, relationships, and renewal. And it's going to set us up for that next phase that is going to be a time of rebuilding, a time to put our hands to the plow, a time to work. Amen?